Thanks so much for uh, the kind welcome and introduction, Bruce, and good morning everyone. It's great to see so many of you attend the early Saturday morning part of the conference. I hear there were more uh, cocktails and, and late night karaoke after the awards banquet last night, so it's great to see that so many of you, uh, as Bruce mentioned, stuck with us. Um, it's also great to be back in the Treasure State. Uh, the last time I was in Montana was in the summer of 2017 when I had the opportunity to spend four weeks uh, at the Montana Historical Society conducting research on the topic of my presentation today, which you can see here on the slide is titled The Irish and Chinese in Montana. That research trip and the research findings I'm sharing with you uh, today would not be possible without the generous support of a James Bradley Fellowship. And I, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the dedicated staff at the Montana Historical Society who were um, who are also integral to the work that we do as historians. They really <clears throat> went out of their way and helped me track down um, invaluable and hard to find uh, primary sources related to my research project. And finally, just thanks to uh, all of the organizers and participants for making this a wonderful conference and also including me in the discussions. As many of you know, there is a rich body of work on, on the Irish in Montana. And the same can be said for the history of the Chinese in Montana. And from this work, we know that both groups played a central role in the rapid growth and development of Montana during its, its territory and early statehood phases. The Irish and Chinese extracted precious metals such as gold, and as Bruce mentioned in the summary of my work, um, their labor and ingenuity were key to the construction of the Northern Pacific Railroad across Montana, just to give a couple of examples um, of the role these pioneers, Irish Chinese pioneers, played in Montana, early Montana history. However, we know very little about relations between the Irish and Chinese in Montana, and there is no in-depth study of the comparative experiences of both groups in Montana. So my research addresses these gaps in the literature, essentially bringing the fields of Irish American studies and, and Chinese American studies into closer dialogue with one another. And I think this is important because the experiences of one group in Montana cannot be fully understood in isolation from the other group. And I hope that will become clear as to why that is the case by the end of this presentation. I would also argue that the experiences of the Irish and Chinese in Montana cannot be fully understood in isolation from their experiences and relations in the United States and other parts of the world. For example, what was distinct about the Irish and Chinese experience or their intergroup dynamic in Montana? So, a comparative framework is, is very much necessary to answer these questions, which means extending our research and analysis beyond Montana. And my research on the Irish and Chinese in Montana does just that. It fits into a larger book project that I'm uh, currently working on, uh, titled The Global Irish in Chinese. Bruce has already summarized that for you, so I don't need to go there again. Um, <laughs> Well, basically, you know, it's the first book to examine connections between Ireland and China and um, relations between the Irish and Chinese in the United States, the British Empire, and the broader Pacific world since the late 18th century. So I think a brief summary just of the larger book project will be useful for those of you less familiar with this topic and help you all better understand relations between the Irish and Chinese in Montana, including their, their comparative experiences. So let's begin with some historical background information and, and context for why were and when the histories of Ireland and China and the Irish 
and Chinese diasporas became intertwined. So two of the major processes in world history that initially brought thousands of Irish and Chinese into close proximity and contact were 19th century Western imperialism in China and mid 19th century Pacific world so gold rushes. So on this slide you can see a map of the Pacific world which will just help you visualize the location of these initial points of uh, interaction between the Irish and Chinese. So there you can see a blue pin on the map which denotes China, which was a major point of contact between the Irish and Chinese beginning in the late 18th century when a stream of Irish made their way to China under the flags of the United States and the British Empire. And the Irish played a key role in the expansion of the United States and British interests in China. Now you'll notice then the red pins on, on the map, this map of the Pacific world, denote these um, Pacific world gold rushes that brought tens of thousands, tens of thousands of Irish and Chinese in close proximity and contact. Beginning with the California gold rush in 1848 and then quickly followed by the New South Wales and uh, Victorian uh, gold rushes in Australia just down here. And then you had the Fraser Canyon gold rush in British Columbia, just up here. And then in, in New Zealand, you had the Otago uh, gold rush. So that's what's bringing large numbers of Irish and Chinese into contact around the world. Um, so I'll briefly elaborate on the first process. You know, the many Irish who made their way to China in the service of the United States and the British Empire. And then I'll talk about the Pacific world gold rushes, including the gold rush in Montana. Um, so beginning in the late 18th century, as I mentioned, a, a stream of Irish made their way to China under the flags of the United States and the British Empire. And they're central to expanding uh, the Western influence in China. And if we even go back to the late 18th century when the British Empire sent its first diplomatic mission to China in 1793, it was led by Irish-born George McCartney. And here you have an image of McCartney at the emperor's court asking for a list of concessions. You know, the British wanted to open up China to further trade because since the mid 18th century, trade with China was confined to the port of Canton. So modern day Guangzhou in, in southern China. So that's the only contact you could have with the Chinese. So the British wanted to open this up and the Americans wanted to get in the action too. And, the newly independent United States sent their first ship, the Empress of China, in 1784 from New York. And it was captained by Irish-born uh, John Green. And this ship inaugurated um, relations between the United States and China. So from first contacts through the 19th century, the Irish play a major role in expanding influence of the United States and the British Empire. And half a century later, we have what was called the Opium War, uh, which resulted in the British waging war against China, essentially to open China up by force. And the commander in chief of British forces was Irish born Hugh Gough, all right? So he, he led the forces that defeated the Chinese. And the Irish had their own regiments. Here's an image of the 18th Royal Irish Regiment of Foot. Um, and that win in the Opium War allowed Henry Pottinger, who was uh, the Queen's envoy to China, to negotiate this treaty, the Treaty of, of Nanking, or Nanjing in 1842, which essentially opened China up to what the Chinese call a century of humiliation. You have these unequal treaties that they call, and basically granting first the British, but then the other mm -hmm. Western powers concessions in China. So you have these treaty ports open up in China, and uh, along the Chinese coast and you know this infringes on Chinese sovereignty and after the Opium Wars a stream of Irish go to Treaty Port China in a variety of capacities which you can see here on the slide and serve the United States and the British Empire and really play a key role in expanding and sustaining this, this, this Treaty Port China. So that's just the Irish in, in, in China, the, the blue 
pin on the map. Now we're going to turn our attention to these specific world gold rushes. So this is where Montana fits into larger world history, right? So Montana um, had its own gold rush in the 1860s, which bring a lot of Chinese to Montana, and, uh, Irish and other groups as well. But it fits into this broader history of 19th century gold rushes. And here's a select few I have on the slide here. Uh, here is North America, variety of gold rushes. I, met, I started off with California in my presentation, and, and here's Australia and New Zealand. So the Irish and Chinese make their way to most of these, these gold rushes. And you can see here some of the major mining towns in Montana. Of course, after gold, you have um, mining of, of other precious metals, such as uh, silver and copper. So I'm going to come back to the gold rushes uh, in, uh, and mining in Montana in a minute, but I want to just briefly talk about the other major force bringing large numbers of Irish and Chinese into contact. Anyone know what that was? Railroads. Railroads, right. So a predominantly Irish and Chinese workforce built North America's first five, first five transcontinental railroads spanning the Panamanian jungle to the Canadian Rockings, Rockies. Um, which again were instrumental in peopling the North American West with non-indigenous settlers, linking East and Western North America and facilitating the transportation of North American produce and goods to Pacific markets. In other words, Irish and Chinese labor and ingenuity helped expand Britain's empire in the Pacific and paved the way for America's rise to major power status in the Pacific. So those railroads, the Panama Railroad was arguably America's uh, first transcontinental railroad because this um, linked New York with the California Gold Rush. This is how this was the quickest way to get to California after it was built in 1855. The Irish and Chinese um, worked on the Southern Pacific and also the Central and Union Pacific, which made up the, Amer the first transcontinental railroad built in the United States. And then, of course, they they worked on the um, the Northern Pacific Railroad, and up until the 1870s, the Irish dominated railroad work in the United States. In 1870, you have something like 37,000 Irish working in the railroad industry, unskilled laborers, and these railroads would not have been built when they were built without the, this tens of thousands of Irish and Chinese laborers. Um, the same applies to the, the Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, and of course, the Northern Pacific Railway, you had a mostly Chinese labor force on the eastern side, and on the western side, you had uh, a mostly Irish uh, labor force. And you know, I, I would say that no Irish workers, no Chinese workers, no last bike in Montana, no railroad in. Northern Pacific Railroad in 1883. Without this labor, it was crucial to it. Um, and I guess two of the most iconic images associated with the last spikes of the first transcontinental railroad uh, is this photograph here by Andrew Russell um, off the last spike, the joining of the rails, the Union Pacific, the Central Pacific. And most of you are probably very familiar with this one on the right, which is prominently displayed in the Montana uh, Capitol, State Capitol building. Um, but what's missing from these two, these two images? Chinese. The Chinese, but even the Irish workers too. They're either they're either missing or they're peripheral to these these images that you know dominate you know high school text high school standard textbooks of building the railroad you know you have the industrialists you have the dignitaries like um, you know former president grant uh, henry villard you have stanford in the other picture leland stanford um, powerful influential people but the story of the workers is sort of how we see these these two images is is represented in the larger mainstream textbooks, right? We know very little about the experience of the Irish and Chinese workers. Um, and I and my students have tried to sort of rectify that, at least on, on the Irish side. We set up this digital humanities project, um, the Irish Railroad Workers Project, uh, which aims to document the contributions and experiences of the thousands of Irish and other workers, you know, who, who built 
these, these railroads. And right now it's focused on the first transcontinental railroad because next year is the 150th anniversary of the completion of that railroad. But eventually we plan to extend our, our work into the Northern Pacific Railroad, including in Montana, just to give people a better understanding of the lives of these workers who built, built the railroads. Um, and it's very hard to <coughs> present the Chinese um, side of things because of the lack of textual materials. So what I've mostly relied on my research is, is newspaper articles and payroll records. The payroll records really need to be examined for the first transcontinental railroad and the Northern Pacific Railroad. But this is just one representative example from some of the, the newspaper sources, just a clipping from the Billings Herald in 1882. You know, it talks about construction of the Clark Forks Division over the uh, Coeur d'Alene Mountains. And then at the bottom it talks about the work of construction proceeds as rapidly as possible. For miles in advance of the track, gangs of Chinamen and Irishmen swarm along the line preparing the roadbed. Um, but in terms of understanding their experiences and interactions on the railroad, I thought like the, the payroll records are quite revealing. So if we compare the, the Central Pacific payroll records and then the Northern Pacific payroll records, we'll notice that the Irish and Chinese were working together. There was workplace cooperation. They were in the same camps with one another. And this was kind of surprising to me because they had a very hostile relationship with one another and traditional perspectives are that you know, their camps are segregated, the workers are segregated. But here you'll see in this one payroll record from the Central Pacific Railroad, um, camp number 21, you have A Joseph, A Samuel, A Charles, and the Chinese are usually listed as A something in the payroll records. And uh, you have Pat Mooney in there as well, Irish Pat Mooney, the blacksmith. So just here on the right is, is sort of the, the, the roles that they perform, and this is what they, their, their daily pay. But already you can see that there's a hierarchy on the railroads, right? So when the Chinese come and work in the railroads, the Irish are elevated in the positions of you know, supervisory roles and they're paid more, they have skilled jobs, leadership roles. The Chinese are largely working in a subservient roles you know, as cooks and waiters. And, um, but again, A. Charles here is the blacksmith helper. He's helping Pat Mooney. So you have a degree of cooperation between both of these groups. Um, just to give you another example from the Central Pacific Railroad, you have John O'Brien, the blacksmith, uh, his helpers, and you have A Fook, who is a blacksmith also, but he's only getting 130 per day, whereas John O'Brien is getting 250. So they're performing the same task, but you have this hierarchy, racial hierarchy in terms of pay and privileges. Um, and if we look then at the payroll records for the Northern Pacific Railroad, just here on the right is, is the name of um, John Joseph Donovan, who was the son of Irish immigrants. And he supervised much of the railroad construction in Montana and all the way to the Pacific Northwest. Um, but you'll notice that the groups of workers that he is supervising are, you can see here on the left is the payroll record, but I've presented clippings here so you can see it a bit better. But here you have penciled in and in pen the Chinese. And the Chinese are working on grading, which is sort of one of the more laborious, difficult tasks, right? So you have the Chinese here. We also have laborers doing grading as well. So you have Irish workers and Chinese workers uh, doing uh, the grading in Montana and beyond. Uh, here's just another payroll record on the left here. Again, this is a clipping from this payroll record. Chinese are working on, on surfacing. You can see here it says Chinamen. And notice that, that the Chinese are getting 80 cents per day, whereas the other laborers are getting $2 per day. And the four men are getting $3 per day. And the Chinese aren't involved in the track laying at all. That was usually done by, by the Irish on the Central Pacific Railroad and, and um, the Northern Pacific. Here's another example from the payroll records. You have William McGuire, <coughs> um, who's an Irish foreman, he's getting $65 per month, and his Irish helper, Ah John, is getting a dollar a day, okay? You can see here, he, he's getting a dollar a day um, for, his, for his labor. But Maguire is supervising this larger, larger gang of Chinese workers. 
Um, this particular gang is called An Yuang Hai, section one of the railroad they're working on. Um, so here's just another example of, um, you have Laurie Toomey, the foreman, and you have Mike Leahy, they're both Irish, again, supervising what's called in the, real, the payroll record a floating, a floating gang number eight, which is these gang of Chinese laborers being overseen and supervised by um, these Irish um, foremen. Uh, so I guess the key point here is, is that you do have cooperation between the Irish and Chinese in building the Northern Pacific uh, Railroad. And the Irish and Chinese are, are central to the construction of the railroad. You have something like 10,000 Chinese working on the Northern Pacific, the Eastern side, including roughly more than 3,000 in Montana and comparable numbers on the Western side um, with the Irish. But there are Irish on the Eastern side as well, supervising the Chinese who are doing uh, much of the labor. And, you know, the Irish and Chinese are working on the railroads right up to the end, uh, up to the Golden Spike, which they're not, they're missing from those iconic images, but they're building right up to the end. And it's interesting that in both the Central Pacific Railroad and the Northern Pacific Railroad, you have many accounts of the Irish and Chinese um, racing one another to complete work. And on the Central Pacific, a group of Irish laborers set a world record 10 miles and 56 feet of railroad track in one day, April 29, 1869. And here's the payroll record confirming that. Just here, and we have the names of the laborers in the payroll record. And you have a similar situation in, uh, the Northern, with the Northern Pacific Railroad in the last mile. And one journalist was on the scene, and here's how he describes it. He, he talks about how a contest began. Uh, workers began a race to complete the last mile. Caucasians from the east, Chinese from the west, who would finish first? And um, you know, he talks about victory from the east, the Caucasians. The Chinese gained the spot five minutes later. The Irish beat the Chinese to it. Um, so this hierarchy that we see on the railroads in terms of relations between the Irish and Chinese, I guess one way of uh, understanding it is, is, is looking beyond the railroads and seeing what is going on uh, off the railroads in Mon Montana life, but in the American West more broadly. And, um, you know, you, you had a series of anti-Chinese movements, not just in the United States, but all those white settler societies that I, I showed on that map of the Pacific world, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and these anti-Chinese movements result in immigration restriction laws, which essentially prohibit Chinese workers from immigrating to the United States, Canada, Australia, and, and, and South Africa. And the Irish were at the forefront of these, these anti-Chinese movements. If we just take an example, the American West in California, which was the epicenter of the anti-Chinese movement in the United States, um, when California sent two special missions east of the Rockies to lobby for immigration restriction, you know, uh, to the White House and to meet with members of Congress, both of those missions were met were led by men from County Cork in Ireland, uh, Dennis Kearney here in the right, and, and Philip Roach here in the left. And Dennis Kearney was the leader of the working men's party in California and you know he went east to the Rockies and tens of thousands followed his every move and learned about his message you know he would end every speak speech with the Chinese Moscow um, and Montana as well the Irish are very hostile to the Chinese and you don't see the same degree of, of violence in Montana as other parts of the American West but the Irish are by and large very hostile to the Chinese because in the 19th century, you know, the Irish are providing much of the workforce, the labor for America's uh, great industrial projects, and they're very much involved in the labor movement. The Irish dominate the late 19th, early 20th century labor movement, and arguably the Irish have most to lose from the Chinese having the same rights as they do, gaining citizenship, okay? And of course, there's the other added dimension of the Chinese being brought in as strike breakers, lowering wages, and so to try and understand this 
tension between the Irish and Chinese. One way to understand it was to look at newspapers and all of these newspapers on the slide here I've, I've mined, I've looked through and uh, the newspapers in Montana, the Irish Catholic newspapers I looked at were the Montana Catholic, the Rocky Mountain Celts, the Anaconda Standard many of you are familiar with and I have an asterisk next to that. It didn't so much focus on Irish affairs but you know, it was a mouthpiece of Marcus Daly, who was an Irish immigrant uh, from County Cavan. Uh, he grew up in a, t a town about 45 minute drive from where I grew up. Um, and all of these newspapers were very hostile to the Chinese and called for Chinese immigration restriction. Um, and just to focus in on Montana, for example, one of the editorials in the Rocky Mountain Celt supported the boycott against the Chinese, for example, in the 1890s. Um, you know, it talks about the legitimate ways the labor unions urged their citizens, the duty they owed their own flesh and blood to the importance of discouraging the in-migration of a race whose very presence polluted morality. And they raised their voice for the protection of the working women against the base servitude of a competition which led either to starvation or prostitution. And again, the Anaconda Standard talks about the loathsome Mongolian must go, employers of heathens must give work, work to whites. So these Irish newspapers are littered with these editorials, very negative towards the Chinese and calling for Chinese exclusion, immigration restriction legislation. And I guess I'll just share with you two images, representative images that appear in these newspapers, which kind of encapsulate the, the sentiment in these newspapers and then how that perhaps influenced Irish attitudes and perceptions towards the Chinese. So this is one example of how the Chinese are appearing in a pro, a Irish labour newspapers. The Irish World, prominent, most widely read Irish newspaper in the United States. Copies of this would have found their way to Montana as well. And of course you see an image of the Chinese here in the back of rats swarming across the Pacific Ocean to take the jobs of Irish labourers in the American West and places like Montana. This rat here, you know, it's suggesting that the Chinese are willing to live on a diet of rats and rice and lower living standards and work for 10 cents, 10 cents per day when it took at least a dollar to sustain a family. So you have these images in the Irish newspapers and um, this is causing tension between Irish workers and the Chinese and if we think of the Irish Catholic newspapers, this is a representative example uh, which appeared in the McGee's Illustrated Weekly and here you have a striking Irish worker in the foreground and behind again it's the swarm of Chinese coming in as strike breakers and, and taking jobs. Okay, So these are the kind of images that are appearing, the editorials are appearing in Irish publications and you can see why the Irish were very much at the forefront of the boycotts against the Chinese in Montana. So the Irish, it wasn't an exclusively Irish movement against the Chinese, but you know, the Irish are very, very prominently involved. They dominate the labor movement. The labor unions are leading the charge against the Chinese in Montana in places like Butte. Um, the Knights of Labor, the Irish dominate the leadership positions of the Knights of Labor and its rank and file. Um, the, the Silver Bow Trades and Labour Assembly, which was an umbrella organization for 30 unions in, in, in Butte, Montana. At the time of the 1886-97 boycott, the president was, was Patrick Bournes, uh, the son of Irish immigrants. Um, Butte Miners Union was dominated by the Irish, it was very hostile to uh, the Chinese and of course the Chinese were forbidden to work in in hard rock mining and in industrial mining. Daly uh, kept the, the Chinese out of um, the mining industry in Anaconda for example. Uh, the Chinese population had dwindled there by 1900 um, and the Chinese population in Butte sustained itself but the numbers radically fell uh, as a result of these anti-Chinese movements and these boycotts and so it's important to note that the Chinese were not passive victims right so they they fought back against their detractors including the Irish and what my research shows is that
in all these places I look at, if you can just visualize that map of the Pacific world again, in all of these places I look at, the Irish are involved in these anti-Chinese movements, but the Chinese fight back in a variety of ways. You know, the newspaper accounts of them getting into fights with one another, shooting the Irish. Chinese diplomats lodge complaints with, for example, the State Department. The Chinese also, the elites write English language editorials denouncing the anti-Chinese movement and, you know, the Irish, the Chinese describe themselves as superior to, to uh, the, the Chinese describe themselves as superior to the Irish. You know, 19th century America was not a kind place to the Irish, either the Catholic Irish in particular. And the Chinese are aware of this and they try and sort of play up this among white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and, and Protestant missionaries as well. But they also challenge the Irish uh, in courts of law, and this is something that we see which happens in with the, the boycotts in Butte, for example. Um, here's a petition signed by all of these Chinese in, in Butte, Montana, sent to the Chinese ambassador, Wu Tingfang, um, who is based in Washington, D.C., and Wu Tingfang sent their this petition to the State Department asking for damages and reparations. So the Chinese managed to, to have an injunction against the boycott, but they, they weren't compensated for the, uh, this, this boycott in, in, in Butte, Montana. And one thing that I also noticed looking at the Chinese sources is that the Chinese are keenly aware that the Irish are a distinct ethnic group, right? So often the Irish get lumped in with like white Americans or broad terms such as Euro-American, but the, Irish, the Chinese are keenly aware that the Irish are distinct, that they play a prominent role in the labor movement, that they dominate city politics, late 19, early 20th century in many of America's major cities, and the Irish have the power to agitate and call for Chinese exclusion. And it got to the point where the Chinese diplomats were getting so many complaints from the Chinese in America that a joke circulating among Chinese diplomats was to quote one of them that Ireland is the only country the Irish man does not rule. Essentially saying that the Irish in Ireland, colonized by the British Empire, have no political power, but they come to the United States, they come to places like Montana, they run the mining industry, control the labor movement, are probably involved in politics, and they're trying to keep us out of the country. So. Um, and this goes all the way up to the upper echelons of the Chinese diplomatic service. To someone like Prince Gong in Beijing, who's the equivalent of the Secretary of State, okay? Um, and you have China's preeminent statesman, Li Hongzhang. You know, this is what he says about the Irish. And, you know, the Chinese have their prejudices towards the Irish as well. It works both ways. But, you know, he talks about, quote, the Irish and laboring classes wish to monopolize the labor market. The Chinese are their strong rivals and competitors, and they wish to exclude them. By excluding the Chinese and taking the Irish, you get inferior labor and pay superior prices for it. A Chinaman lives a more simple life than an Irishman, and the Irish hate the Chinese because they are possessors of high virtues. <laughs> this is in an interview with a New York Times uh, reporter. Um, and even when the U.S. began to move towards uh, immigration restriction negotiations with the Chinese, um, you had Chinese or American diplomats went to China and met with Chinese officials. And the two Chinese officials heading the Chinese delegation, uh, Li Hongzhao and Bao Yun, uh, they also talked about the Irish in California, Montana, the American West, and described, you know, reports were coming back of the Irish role in these anti-Chinese movements in the American West, and they described the Irish uh, as uh, Changzu Shuchong, which roughly translates as a powerful and influential race, and they described relations between the Irish and Chinese as Shui Tan, basically water and charcoal or water and oil, basically, they don't mix very well, right? So, um, so while the Irish play uh, a major role in these anti-Chinese movements, including in Montana, the Irish are not a monolithic 
block or group, right? You do have exceptions to the rule, okay? So I, I have found cases of like a shoemaker in San Francisco, for example, a governor in British Columbia, um, Arthur Kennedy, uh, Irish governor, an archbishop in Sydney, and they they stood they stood out and ch actually championed Chinese racial equality, but I, I haven't found a figure such as that in Montana. You know, someone from the Irish community that stood up and said this is wrong. You know, we shouldn't be excluding the Chinese, and you know, that champion Chinese racial equality and continued immigration. Um, I also found cases of workplace cooperation on the East Coast between genuine workplace cooperation. On the railroads, there's the racial hierarchy, there's the, the differences in pay and privileges. But in this factory in Belleville, New Jersey, steam laundry factory, you had Irish women and Chinese men working in the factory together, earning the same pay, okay? Here you have an image of one of the Irish laundry workers training in a group of the Chinese who was working in the, the factory. The Chinese were able to migrate eastwards after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And I discovered numerous marriages, dozens of marriages between Irish women and Chinese men in places like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, the Australian colonies. Um, and here just you have some representative images. On the left you have an Irish girl dressed in Chinese attire, married with her Chinese husband. On the right, you have Yu Wing, a Chinese cigar, cigar peddler, with his, to quote the Daily, New York Daily Graphic, his hybrid Irish family. So you had intermarriage, you had family formation between Irish women and Chinese men. Um, but this exacerbated conflict between Irish men and, and Chinese men, because uh, the Irish wanted to distance themselves from the Chinese. and. Um, exclude them. So we see this on the east coast of the United States and pl places in uh, the Australian colonies. But in the American West, I really struggle to find more of this solidarity, these marriages. Um, at least in, for Montana as well, the four weeks I was doing my research, I, I didn't come across any of these marriages. So um, I'm currently preparing my research to submit to the Montana magazine Western History. So in the next uh, fall semester, perhaps if any of you are aware or if any of you stumble across any information related to marriages between Irish women and Chinese men in Montana, it would be great if you could share that research with me. You can contact me at this, this email address. So this is just some of my research findings, you know, mostly focused on the railroads and mining um, and then this wider context into where Montana fits, you know. Uh, these broader forces in world history, railroad construction, mining, Montana is very much part of that and the Irish and Chinese are, are part of these processes that, that shape the modern world in, including Montana's early history. So um, I think I, I'll leave it there for now and you know I'm, I'm happy to open it up to the floor for, for questions and discussion and I'm going to be participating in the conference for the rest of the day, so I'm, I'm happy to continue the discussion whenever we run out of time. So thank you very much for attending this morning.